Peace and blessings. If you like what you hear, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. We're going to get into True to the Game, a classic by Terry Woods. A Night Out, Harlem, New York. It was the summer of 1988, and it was hot, too hot. Harlem had to be the hottest place on the planet in the summertime. Exiting the West Riverside Drive on 125th Street, Gina was amazed to see so many people standing outside a nightclub. Damn, look at that limousine, girl. We need to be with them. Laughing out loud, she was now suddenly anxious to get uptown. We damn sure do, said Sahara, looking smug. It was amazing. There was nothing like it. 125th was a mini Greek playland in the middle of Harlem. Gina had no understanding. It wasn't like Philly. It was larger. And the niggas looked like Eric B. and Rakim no- with humongous gold chains and diamond medallions the sides of bread plates. If it was meant to represent wealth, that shit did its job. And Gina liked it. She looked at the girls and could not help staring at them. They had no clothes on. They were sexy and revealing, and Gina wanted to be among them. Fucking with niggas, getting her life on. New York was the shit. There was no way she could live there, though. It was so fast. Too fast. Fast niggas, fast cars, and fast lifestyles. The magnitude was large as was the amount of men. Even the cars in New York looked different. Gina didn't know if it was the rims or the tires or what was going on. The dashboards were customized, leather MCM and Louis Vuitton seats, not to mention the detailed piping and thousand dollar sound systems. That shit turned her the fuck on. Everything about New York turned her on, especially the guys, and to think, This was all so normal for them. Suddenly, Sahara did an about face and shouted, No, look at that BMW. Is he the man of life or what? Riding by, there he was, with a squad of brothers deep in his beamer. She couldn't contain herself. Leaning out the window, she yelled, Hi! Turning back to Gina, she grabbed her arm. Girl, don't he look good? Sahara, bitch, is you crazy? This is Harlem. You can't just wave at these people up here. Gina tried to pull the top of her friend's body back in the car. Oh, shit, Gina. He's pulling over. Yeah, but he's all the way on the opposite side of the street. Against Gina's protest, Sahara made a U-turn into traffic, causing every moving vehicle to screech to a standstill so she could just meet the guy driving the BMW. She greeted them even as she double-parked behind the Beamer, waving and calling to the driver. He stepped out of the car, fine as wine, and walked toward the girls. What's up? What's up? Sahara repeated. What's your name? He asked, walking on them. Getting out the car, she replied. I'm Sahara. What's yours? Rasson. I see you have Pennsylvania tags. You from Philly? Sahara asked. Yeah, tell your girlfriend get out the car. Gina insinuated herself out the car and chimed. I'm Gina. Rasan openly admired what he saw. What's up, Gina? I'm Rasan. That's my homie Quadin in the car. Why don't you go over there and talk to him? What does he look like? Smiling, he told her. Go and see. How convenient, she thought. Sahara got the driver, and I got the passenger. When she reached the other car, she announced, Hi, I'm Gina. Your friend Rasson told me I should come over here and talk to you. Quadir studied Gina as though he'd just been introduced to a goddess. My name is Quadir. After another minute, he thought he should say something and stop staring. So, do you live in New York? No, I live in Philly. What about you? I live in North Philly. Oh, I live out west. What are you doing up here? Gina thought quickly 
how to cover her and Sahara's manhunting designs on this side of the Lincoln Tunnel. Well, my aunt is sick, and I just came up here to spend the day with her. It's just a little white lie, she told herself. It can't hurt. What about you? Business. Had to take care of some business, he told her, thinking about the kilos of cocaine in his trunk. What's a pretty girl like you doing out here in this big city all alone? I'm not alone. Gina's head was reeling from Quadir's blatant adoration, and every square inch of her body sported a blush. I'm with my girlfriend, Sahara. Oh, he said, looking at Sahara as if to say, how the hell is she going to save you? Shifting back to reality, remembering the kilos of cocaine in the trunk of the Beamer, he said, we got to go, but I want to see you tomorrow. Will you be in Philly tomorrow? Yes. Want to switch numbers? Most definitely. She said goodbye to Quadir and pocketed his number. Even though he wasn't driving, he was nice. He was dark-skinned. And that definitely was a plus. Not to mention the diamond bezel Rolex he had on. Damn, she thought. The man is dark as night. But his beard and his mustache were so sexy. She'd definitely be trying to see him tomorrow. Which for her was a lifetime away. Gina and Sahara partied hard and met many guys that night, but like a magnet, Quadir kept turning up in her thoughts. Before Gina got on the turnpike, she went up to 145th Street to get a Willy Burger. She loved Willy Burgers. Nothing could fuck with them in the middle of the night. No lie, like 125th Street, the saga continued. Mad money niggas were everywhere. She got some gas from the station down the street and was ready to make her journey back home. Crossing the George Washington Bridge, she couldn't help but look over at New York's skyline. New York was the most happening town she knew of. She always hated leaving. Finally, reaching exit 6, Gina thought, Home sweet home. It was about 5.30 a.m. when they reached Sahara's mother's house. Gina parked the rental car and looked at her best friend and the slobber and spit drooling out her mouth. Sahara, wake up, we're home. She nudged her leg and called to wake her up after she parked the car. Sahara was out, and Gina knew it would be a struggle to get her back to life. Another few minutes of calling out to her friend, and Sahara finally wiped her mouth and opened her eyes. Come on, let's go, I'm tired. You've been sleeping, I haven't. Oh, did you see the EPMD guy, Eric? How could I have missed him? He almost hit your simple ass when you jumped in front of his bends. You really have some serious issues to deal with. Don't even try it. You got nerve. You're jealous because I got Ken Du's number. Don't be mad. Besides, I saw you talking to what's his name? Quadir? Yeah, him. Sahara talked as if Gina had behaved as poorly as she did. What about this guy? Look at our picture. Now tell me he isn't all that. I could have sucked his dick right out there on 125th Street. I just know you could have, and I'm sure you will, stated Gina with more sarcasm as she shook her head. And that motherfucker in the Range Rover, if it wasn't for you, I would have really gotten my young life on. I just know you would have. Well, what did you think of him, Sahara insisted. Did you think he was cute or what? Sahara, think the fuck of who? I don't know what you're talking about. Sahara paid her no mind. Once they were inside the house, Sahara started counting the telephone numbers, which she had collected over the course of the evening. Seven numbers! She hollered. Gina couldn't help but to look at her friend in disbelief. I'm going to sleep. Gina and Sahara had been friends since they were five years old. Both grew up down in Richard Allen. The projects niggas wouldn't go to if they wasn't from there. When Sahara was 12, her family moved out to West Philly on 54th and Ray Street. Even though they didn't go to school together, after Sahara moved, she and Gina always kept in touch. When Gina turned 17, her uncle Michael got her an apartment on Chancellor Street. He paid all her bills. No one in her family knew. Gina had pleaded with her uncle for years to move her out the projects. He had really been there for her, and whenever she wanted something, he would help her. He kept her in a rental car and gave her money whenever she asked for it. She was fortunate to have someone in her family who made it and could show her the way. She knew plenty of people her age who had no one they could turn to in a time of need. That was one thing Gina could say for herself. Even though she was raised in the projects, 
She had family who believed in taking care of the kids. Some people didn't have family like that, and Gina knew it. Some parents didn't give a fuck one way or the other. Do what you gonna do, cause you gonna fuck something up anyway. That was the attitude. Half of Gina's friends had parents who said, Hey, we got a party to go to. And that's where they were, at the party, partying. Or, if they weren't at the party, they were too busy getting high. Then you had the motherfuckers sitting right there in the house not giving a damn whether the kids were in the house, in the street, hungry or safe. A whole generation sat back and said, fuck it, I'm just not going to raise my kids. Hence, the saga began. Shit was rough as hell in Philly. That's why Gina liked her little trips to other cities. Gina and Sahara had done their share of city hopping too. Seeing that there was other people out there, not just West Philly or the projects, was positive reinforcement for them. They went to the harbor in Baltimore and met niggas with boats. They went to D.C. like the guys but couldn't take the go-go scene. They traveled to Atlanta and met brothers with pets. From Miami to New York, they were there. They constantly received flyers for out-of-town parties in the mail. Life was just one big party. Gina was into the party scene. The same faces, the same places, and the same circles. When the junior mafia began spreading cocaine throughout the city, money was flowing like water from a faucet, and niggas were giving it up as if it were leaves on trees. Gina's whole entourage of male companions were young, handsome, and very wealthy drug dealers. Hustlers who loved to come on a set and just break a nigga off. It was too good to be true. And don't talk about sex. You were definitely getting broke down for dropping down. Wasn't no questions asked. Gina and Sahara dropped down. Way down for the lifestyle they were living. The only way not to give the sisters their props was if they weren't getting paper. Thoroughbreds of the streets getting money was what it was all about. And any way you could get it, you were supposed to. Across town, on a little side street, sat a burgundy Cadillac. The driver was eagerly and carefully aware of the sound of the street. He had been sitting in the car for three hours, waiting in anticipation. The movement of a tree branch blowing in the wind grasped his attention. He turned back to the gray screen door across the street. 3601, he thought to himself, deciding that would be a good number to play. He reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a small bag of cocaine. He dumped a tiny pile between his thumb and his pointer finger and held it up to his nose. After he fed his nostrils, he took his tongue and licked his hand clean. On the seat beside him, laid a Uzi semi-automatic. He picked up the gun, took out the clip, restlessly, he threw it back in already knowing it was loaded. The gray screen door flew open and four guys emerged. They hopped into an MPV, never noticing the burgundy Cadillac following them. The next morning, Gina woke up to the sound of Sahara's four brothers and sisters acting like they were out of their minds. What time is it? She asked as Miss Bolden walked by the doorway. Oh, good morning, Gina. It's 9.30, baby. You want some breakfast? Hell no, thought Gina. I want some sleep. No, ma'am, she replied. I have to go. Tell Sahara to call me. Gina was out of there with the quickness. On her way to the house, she stopped to get her favorite pancakes. At the intercom, she hollered, No pork. Do not put pork anywhere near my food. Do you understand? No pork. I don't want to see it. The poor girl out the window looked as if she had something to say, but didn't. Gina gave her the money and waited for her food and change. A burgundy Cadillac with black tinted windows sped across the parking lot. All of a sudden, and out of nowhere, thunderous gunfire jolted Gina out of her reverie and continued to echo through her body. The bullet sent a screeching sound through her body as the gunman met his target aimed for the four guys in the MPV. Gina's mind yelled, run, duck down, hide, get the fuck away, settling on none until her survival instincts took her through the natural progression of ducking down and getting her ass out of there. She sped away from the takeout window and tried to exit from the parking lot when the burgundy Cadillac sedan DeVille with the gold trim, tinted windows, and spoked rims cut her off. She slammed on the brakes and missed hitting the driver's door panel by inches. For one long moment, she looked right at the driver. He had a Uzi semi-automatic in his left hand and his right hand on the steering wheel. And at one moment, 
He looked at her and their eyes locked. Gina knew him from somewhere, but did not remember from where. Wondering whether she should say hi, she just sat still as a stop sign and stared at him. Wondering if he should drop her ass too, he pointed the Uzi straight at her head and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. He tried the shit again. The clip was empty. The thought went through him. Yeah, this her lucky day. He threw the gun on the floor and sped away. Gina sat there shaking and confused. She never had a gun pointed at her before. She just knew her beauty saved her. Little did the simpleton know, she had almost become a statistic. Her heart was pounding like drops of hell on a window pane. Talking her hands into obedience, she wrapped her shaky fingers around the steering wheel and instructed her right foot to come back to life and ease up on the brake, moving slowly toward the exit. She carefully looked both ways before entering onto 52nd Street. She drove in silence, creeping down the street, not even listening to the radio. She couldn't believe what just happened, and she kept checking the rearview mirror to see if anyone was behind her. Man, her mind was playing tricks on her. The burgundy Cadillac was so clear in her mind, and the license plate tag, Mafia 23, was even clearer. Reaching her favorite parking spot between the two trees in front of her door, she noticed Jamal, her boyfriend, his pathfinder parked down the street. She looked close and couldn't believe it. Jamal was sleeping in his Jeep outside her door. She walked over to the Jeep and knocked on the glass window. Jamal jumped out of what looked like a very uncomfortable sleeping position. Where the fuck you been? Gina just looked at him, as if she didn't know what he was talking about. I spent the night over Sahara's Jamal. Oh, that gold digging bitch with the matching hat and shovel? Climbing out the Jeep, he continued. I thought I told you I didn't want you hanging around her. I know what you told me, Jamal, but this is a free country and I can do what I... The words were lost as her body made its way to the pavement with the force of Jamal's backhand. Then he picked her up and began his accusations. I know you've been with another man, bitch. Ain't no way you was sleeping with Sahara unless you and Sahara is fucking each other. Shit, I've been out this motherfucker all night waiting for you. The tears had already begun. I wasn't with nobody. You're a motherfucking liar. Why you gotta lie? The question was stressed with another pop upside her head, causing her to spin around, fall into some bushes. Deciding it was best to remain in contact with the earth, she pleaded with him. Jamal, I wasn't doing nothing. She looked up and saw Miss Gladys looking out her third floor window, watching everything. Rising to face him, she said, Jamal, I'm sorry, I won't go out with her anymore. Where the fuck did you go? I didn't go nowhere. Slap was the sound that could be heard as he hit her again. Gina, don't make me kill you out this motherfucker. Where you been? I said, where the fuck you been all night long? Too scared to say she had gone to party in Harlem, she just looked at him. I'm getting tired of your shit. Jamal, I don't want to fight with you. I'm hungry and I'm tired. That's because your trick ass was out in the street all night. The accusations gathered storm clouds to her eyes. I'm not no trick, Jamal. Focusing directly on his right eye, she realized at that moment, any feeling she had for him was gone, and she was ready to kick him in his nuts and run for safety, as usual. The nigga was crazy. It was in his eyes. If he walked away and she never saw him again, it would make no difference to her. Jamal had been in her life now for a year and a half. He was possessive, controlling, and basically a nuisance. She met him down in North Philly on 22nd and Ridge in a pool hall. He was real sweet and nice in the beginning. Nothing like now. The day they met was dreary and it had begun to rain. He offered her a ride home. He asked her if she would like to get something to eat. She said yes. Gina didn't miss no free meals. Next day, he was at her door. Hi, what are you doing here? She was dressed in only a towel and a shower cap. Get dressed, I'm taking you shopping. They visited every boutique and shoe store that came to his mind. This all made Gina very happy. What luck, she thought. They reached her apartment, and indeed, he was more than welcome to come in. 
Only way she could get all her bags in the house anyway. Once she was finished, pouring over her purchases, hardly remember buying any of it, and putting everything away, she realized she was happier at that moment than she ever been, but didn't know why. Jamal had rolled a joint, which he referred to as a spliff, for the two of them, and lit it, and she collapsed onto the sofa. I'm so tired, Jamal. Why'd you take me shopping and buy all this stuff for me? She really looked confused about the whole thing. The weed was taking effect. I mean, you don't even know me. That's okay. You're gonna let me know you, right? Right. Anything you say, she thought, looking totally satisfied at her diminished closet space. She passed the spliff back to Jamal after choking half to death and decided she had enough. For no reason, she jumped up and shut the mini blinds. Jamal realized she'd become paranoid, and he became determined that he wouldn't miss his chance before she was too far gone. Through a short tirade, he tried to chill her out, and before she even knew what happened, they were on the floor kissing, Jamal pulling at her clothes. What are you doing? She knew she should stop him. Don't you think we should get to know each other? Don't you think we should wear a condom? We don't really know each other at all. He silenced her with a kiss, and she knew her struggles were in vain. Before she knew it, he was inside her. Doesn't it feel good? He whispered. She could only think, you're a fucking stranger, and you need to get him off of you. But for fear that he would get mad and take back all that he bought her, she got in the groove, and before it was all over, he was asking her, whose pussy is this? And she answered, yours. After dinner, Jamal dropped her off. For the third time, she looked over her new clothes, then took a bath and slipped into one of her new nightgowns. She no sooner sat down to begin calculating the total of the price tags when the phone rang. Hello? What are you doing? Nothing. I just finished taking a bath and I'm wearing a Victoria's Secret nightgown you bought me. Gina, I can't sleep. Why? What's the matter? Because I can't. I'm coming to get you. When? Are you joking me? No. I'm on my way. Before she could protest, Gina heard the dial tone. Hmm. Can't sleep without me, she mused. My shot is the bomb. In 20 minutes, Jamal was ringing her bell. She was dressed, packed, and ready to go. Thereafter, Jamal refused to sleep without her. He wanted her there morning, noon, and night. He took her to school and picked her up. It got to the point where if she went to the bathroom, he was right there, sitting on the edge of the tub, watching her. My, how things changed. Now he was beating on her in the middle of the Chancellor Street. My, how things have changed. Now he was beating on her in the middle of Chancellor Street. Gina wiped the tears from her eyes as Jamal got into his jeep, belittling. Gina wiped the tears from her eyes as Jamal got into his jeep, belittling and demeaning her verbally. Looking at her hands, she saw blood from where she fell in the bushes. She noted the neighbors as they walked to the steps. She noted the neighbors as she walked to the steps of her house, watching them all standing on their porches peeping out the windows. Nosy motherfuckers. And didn't nobody help. Inside her apartment, Gina went straight to the mirror. She looked horrible. Her face was red, her head was pounding, and she was hungry. Her pale skin, all sore and scratched, throbbed in achy pain, and the tears returned. She had to break away from Jamal. It was like he owned her. She knew it too, but what could she do about it? How could she break away from him? Without him, she had nothing. With him, she was miserable with money. She needed a plan. Or no. On the one hand, she knew that if she tried to stop seeing Jamal, it might cause her more harm than good. On the other hand, 18-year-old Gina wanted to have some fun. Entering her bedroom and turning on the television, she lay down on her bed. So tired, she was falling asleep when she heard the news bulletin. An anchor woman was standing at the very restaurant she had just left. Behind her sat a navy blue Swiss cheese MPV in the parking lot. Three people had died at the restaurant on 52nd Street, 
and one was listed in critical condition. If not for an empty clip, she'd have been one of those statistics. She, if not for an empty clip, she would have been one of those statistics. Gina offered a prayer to God, thanking him for his many blessings.